why do we preach? We preach Christ, that people may hear the message and be changed. We preach Christ resurrected that people may have hope. I don't think I've ever given you this type of pastoral nugget before, but God really, at least for me, opened my eyes to a few things this week for this congregation. To just sermonize for the sake of preaching is useless. It serves no purpose. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Romans 8 declares, he's in us and we're in him. And this is a very delicate subject, as this is a pastoral nugget, that as someone who has been commissioned by God to deliver his word, I pray that the hearers are anointed. Too many times people spend time praying for the preacher to be anointed, and not enough time praying for God to anoint ears to hear and receive. I used to think that listening to a sermon, listening to preaching, if you could walk away, at least with some kernel of something, it would be sufficient but I'm starting to wrestle internally with something. It's not enough to preach a message on Sunday. What do you do with it during the week? Now, I'm not going to come meddling your affairs, but as the spiritual leader of this church, I'm not interested in sermonizing you on a Sunday and not having people reconnect with God's Word throughout the week. And it is your responsibility to stay connected. The reason we preach is through the week. It should produce acts of faith on your part, that when things are not going right, you don't succumb like the Scripture talks about how the Gentiles behave, how the other people will react, as opposed to those who have been given hope. This is what makes you uncommon and different when you encounter a challenge, your eyes, your eyes say it can't, but the eyes of faith say God will. And you plow through, knowing God will be on the other end to meet you as you forge through in faith and claim another promise. Now, this church has gone through so many different phases, and I'm at the place right now where I thought, you know, before I begin to speak, I want this to kind of settle in. If I just come here to sermonize and waste an hour or so of your time and nothing is going on internally, there's no stirrings, good teaching should spar between your friends and your family some conversation on what has been said, some meditation. Comb all the giants of the faith. They'll all say the same thing, and I'm with them on this. You cannot hear a sermon or a message delivered that if the ears are anointed to listen, the heart will receive. And it will bring on conversation, meditation, reflection, and prayer on that subject. Even if it's, Lord, help me, I don't understand this concept, I don't understand this word, or I don't understand this verse of Scripture, but help me. And that's why God gave some gift ministers to the church for passages that have been read many times over that... The gift minister to the church opens up the word, gives understanding, and breathes new life into Scripture that is not new. It's just seen with new and fresh eyes in Christ. Now, I don't want this church to become complacent and act as though we gather on Sunday and it's the one act, and then we just move on, and you move on with your life during the week, and there's never a second thought of what happens on Sunday. Now, if, if this hits you a little bit right in the gut, it should. Because there is no child of God in the sound of my voice 
if you call yourself a child of God that doesn't desire the Father's bread, His Word. Only children who are rebellious or not His own push the food away and, in fact, desire other food. That's about 85% of the church world. Push the food away, give me something else to eat. God's bread is not good enough for most. I know it's good enough for you and it's good enough for me. That's why I come here and I do what I do. But I'm not wanting to see what I think is the disease of many churches. Because I preach grace and because I talk about grace, that either becomes the license to be so complacent in the faith or gives way to, well, we'll just la we'll latch on to her and she can carry us through. No, no, no. I watched people do that to Dr. Scott. Only you and your faith can carry you for the day, and each day requires new faith and new faith acts. Friends, some of you have been here a long time, but for the newer people, learn the promises of God. They're in here, that when a faith challenge comes your way, you're reaching into God's Word instead of leaning on the flesh. Learn the promises of God. Highlight them. Color them. I've colored, I think, every promise I could find that I could latch on to in a time of need because the Scripture says that God is our very present help in time of tr trouble and need. But how else can He help us except that we know His Word, we latch on to, we claim a promise by faith, and we put faith in action. So, uh, listen, each person, each ministry has to do I guess what they see the need is. I see the need for this church to realign a little bit. In expository preaching, which is what I do, taking a verse and pulling it apart because of the gifts that God gave me linguistically and the gifts that He gave me in understanding, it can become very, uh, I would say, dry for some people who are not taking the words being taught lifting them out and making an application. For if, I'm sorry, there is no other self-help, there is no other help you can find except God's Word. If you're not reaching in and applying that to your life, I don't even know why you'd bother listening to any teacher or preacher of the Word. You know, I've said God's Spirit comes in and does the work inside of us. This is true. We also make decisions in our life. What are we going to listen to? In fact, I was just saying to you before we came out here, how in listening to someone who has done a brilliant study and a brilliant book on some of the things that go on in the minds of people based on addiction and addictive behavior, that same uh, window is open to every soul. For what you look at with your eyes, what you open your eyes to and expose your eyes to look at, or what you let come into your ears, that is a choice you make. You can, rather than listening to someone teach you the Word, you can go listen to somebody tell you the power of positive thinking or any other thing that in an auditory method, in a listening method, can be absorbed. What you choose to impute into your brain. You remember, you've all heard this, you are what you eat. Believe me, that's absolutely true because most of America eats a lot of bad food. And we are the fattest country now. We are the, the sickest country. I could go on and on and on. My point is, so it is with what you consume for your spirit what you listen to and what you open your eyes to and what you're open to receive. Why tell you this? Because I really believe that it is the habit of people to get lazy and to act as though as long as I come to church and I sit in the church, I don't need to exercise my faith muscles. I don't need to stretch out and say, by faith, I've said for months now, we have a need. We have financial needs. We have bodily needs within the building. We have prayer needs. There's something for every single person to participate in. Every single person. Not one exclusion in this body. 
Some are not able to be here to answer phones, but you may be far away. You can pray for other people. And in fact, the ones that call in the prayer requests that say, I'm sick and I need help, those are some of the people we should be sending prayer requests to so that they can take their eyes off of their condition for a little while and focus on somebody else's need. Sometimes that's what you need to have happen when you're too self-indulged and self-consumed and wallowing your own self-pity about your condition. So that's one part of what I'm trying to stir up. This time together should bring forth discussion in your private time. It should bring forth more reading of Scripture to go and look at the different verses or things that I've mentioned and meditate and pray. If it's not to grow men and women for the kingdom of God, to rule and reign with Him, I don't know why we're here because I could find many other methods to just make it through today without God. So it's time for us to just really come together in this mindset. I'm wanting to stir some of you up to recognition that there is a responsibility. The listening act and the faithing act, which go hand in hand. Preaching and teaching should produce acts of faith in your life to where what you thought you weren't able to do, you weren't able to go through, you'd never make it beyond. God's Word says differently. And you latch on to that and you hold on until it is pragmatized, realized, and comes to fruition. At that point, you find another situation and another promise to latch hold. Remember I gave the example of What's that thing the kids go on? They go from bar to bar, the monkey bars? That's what the life of faith is, really. You just keep reaching for the next bar. And if you don't reach and you stand in one place, hanging on there in one place, chances are, without moving on to the next, you'll probably do what most kids do, fall to the ground. Voice of experience talking from my childhood, <laughs> going on bars. I said, going on bars, not going in bars, <laughs> in, case, in case some of you are poor listeners. And then let me finally, before I get to my message, address poor listening, because that's the other malady of this church. By the way, it's a malady everywhere. You've heard this before, but you need your hearing and your minds refreshed and renewed on this subject. Most people are very poor listeners. How many of you know that? Wow, that was almost everybody. Cool. All right, at least we've got an honest crowd here today. Most people, and present company, I'm not going to exclude myself. This is what I used to do when I used to sit in church and listen to Dr. Scott. I would periodically latch on to one word that he said. How many of you? No, don't raise your hand. Don't. I don't want to know. He'd say one word, and I would latch on to that one word. I would still hear his voice, but I'd latch on to that one word. You know, we think we're so smart, we can multitask. We can still listen while we're, while we're cogitating over there. Oh, tautology. Oh, philosophical question. What would the tautological sum total? Meanwhile, the sermon is still going on. The word's going forth, and you've, you've, you've left me there. You're miles behind in the cloud somewhere. And that's the way most people listen. And it varies by degree of your capacity to sit and discipline yourself to listen. How many have ever listened to a college professor speak and deliver a one full hour or two hour talk on a lecture? How many have sat through that? All right? And then if you're not careful, most of the time, Many of the lectures that I've heard can be quite monotonous. The monotone voice that then just suddenly leaves your mind into a warping abyss to where you're thinking, oh, my stomach's growling now. <laughs> oh, what was that about, you know, whatever the lecture's on, you, you'll, you'll find yourself drifting back. Dr. Sky used to call that wool gathering. But when we're talking about learning the things of God, it requires harnessing your mind and disciplining yourself to listen and to really pay attention. And you'll find something. If you put into practice earnest discipline to listening, you remember 
Ralph Nichols, are you listening? That whole study, that infamous book that got passed around a few times between the staff when I was first on staff, just to read what Dr. Nichols said about listening. And you just, you don't want to admit it, but you say, oh, crap, that's me. <laughs> because that's the way we tend to approach matters. I heard a couple of things, so it suffices to say I've put together all the pieces. Not enough. Let me tell you what the end total of this produces. Poor listening produces people who have received sound bites of things, and they're not necessarily going to tie them together in the same framework. So one person sitting in the congregation who may not be really trying to harness their listening and listen to every word I'm saying, sometimes even if you find yourself drifting, you should repeat or try and latch on to the words being said. That end product of not disciplining yourself and your mind to listen and stay focused for the time of the discourse going forward produces people who leave here with some idea of a doctrine I haven't even said. And I've been privy to this to see when I read your letters or things come in and people, it's not, this is not interpretation, this is somebody writing a letter to me based on a sermon or based on a message or based on something I said, and it becomes obvious to me they couldn't have heard everything I said. Now, we don't all have, none of us have the capacity to listen, discipline, focused, I'm hearing you, I'm listening to every single word, but when it comes to the Word of God, that's the type of listening that is required for at the end of this delivery of my speech, some thought should be in your mind that then provoke the mind to, wow, I wonder about this and what about that, not while I'm speaking. Now, I'm guilty. I used to do this when Dr. Scott would speak. I'd sit and he'd say one word. I'd, oh, that one word. Or, or he'd say a word or a subject matter, and I'd, I'm guilty of this. I'd sit in the seat and I, wow, I, I, yeah, I wonder whatever happened to the shroud. Yeah, wow, gee, wow. You know, and I'm having my own sermon go on in my mind. Meanwhile, someone who's called to deliver the word to me is speaking to me, and I'm really, you can't multitask, not on God's word. You know, if you want to try and do it with something else, be my guest, but not with God's word. It requires 110% of your attention. Listen, we want God to hear our pleas and hear our dilemmas. He knows all about them, but we want him to give us, God, pay attention to me. And some of us can't even harness and discipline ourselves for a measly little hour of 168 hours of the week. Get real. Now to today's message. You mean, you mean, you mean there's a message too? Oh yeah. I wouldn't come here to do anything else. We are in First Peter. And I want to I want to share something with you in passing, what this study is doing for me. And I pray it's going to do it for you. It's not only opening up new vistas for me to comparatively look at the writings. It's really brought a conviction to me that I haven't had before in terms of reading the scripture and, and really reaching in, not just saying, what is Peter saying to this dispersed church? What is this scripture speaking to us today and really having a now application? We've gone through several chapters. Uh, actually, we've gone through several verses. I think two or two, only two, that's, that's, that's several. It feels like much longer than that, you know, in the Scott tradition, things can just keep going on and on. But we have at least highlighted uh, Peter, who is an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he's writing to those electos, those that we've said the called of God, the chosen electos, pare epidemois, 
And we kind of tried to give a name to that because it's people living among a populace. Uh, we called it pilgrims, sojourners. One translation said strangers uh, of the diaspora. And of course, we've been going through the verse 2, talking about the foreknowledge of God, the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, which produces obedience. And so let me start there for today. Um, you cannot, neither can I, try to be obedient to the hearing of God's Word except that the Spirit is doing the separating work. You say, in the face of what I just said to you in my pastoral nugget, you told, Pastor, you told us we have to listen. That's right, because I'm believing that every single person in this room has risen up in the faith to understand called and chosen of God, saints sitting among me here, not people trying to vacillate or make a decision for Christ, as the evangelists like to call it, but that if you're sitting in this room listening to me, God has already called and chosen you. You cannot, sorry, you cannot start Christianity on any other frame of reference then no man can come except the Father bring them and the Spirit doing the quickening work for you to be sitting here and listening. So I'm not even going to act, uh, act out the evangelist part to say decision for Christ. That was a gratuitous remark. I believe if you're listening that decision's already been made, period. So, the foreknowledge of God, uh, the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. And we said that that should produce, the word in the Greek, producing or resulting in obedience. And we've taken this word before and we've broken it down for you previously from ob and, or ob and dire, to take from the Latin to run to the voice of the sayer, the one speaking, the messenger delivering the word, obediently running to the word of God. And that Word of God begins to kind of take shape for us at the beginning of verse 3. I want you to take note of what the verse begins with, verse 3, because you're no longer and I'm no longer able to read this just as a cursory reading. Blessed be italicized, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. That's where I'm going to stop right now. And I'm going to talk about this word. See, we're no longer able to skirt the issue that if you're hearing and listening, something will result. Blessed, that word in the English, in your King James, is the Greek word, eulogetos. Eulogetos. We get our English word for eulogy. When somebody dies, we wait until somebody dies to give a eulogy, to speak you good words. This verse 3, blessed, your King James reads blessed, but in reality the word is eulogitos. Now this word is very important before I go on and we talk about other things because if we take the people who are being addressed in this letter. These are the chosen people of God who are living amongst the populace who are dispersed, kind of like our congregation a little bit. Then let's just for right now call them sojourners. We are on a journey. We are pilgrims on a journey going through this land which is not our home. And look at the fact that this word blessed is used specifically as a precursor to tell us what we as sojourners and pilgrims are praising God for because this word would have easily have been translated and some of the translations translated this word blessed, eulogitos, as praise, to praise God with good words. We speak good words. In fact, before I started this lesson, I had to look at what was the difference between this word, blessed, 
that begins our text, 1 Peter chapter uh, 1 and uh, verse 3. And the difference between that blessed, and there's another blessed word in the Greek, which is the Beatitudes. You know when it says blessed, 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 different word. If we were to put these words in the Hebrew frame of reference, this word, eulogitos, would be like the Hebrew word uh, baruch. And the blessed of the Beatitudes of Mark chapter 5 would be like ashri. The state of being, the condition of the person, the frame of reference, versus a blessing, and in this case, a blessing spoken with words. Blessing with words. Now, this is important because you can take this passage and read it real quickly. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And two things come to my mind. The first one is Peter is saying, literally, praising God with good words for his abundant mercy regarding the resurrection. We'll get to that. But the reason why I started focusing on this word and began the lesson with this obedience and the hearing that produces obedience to God's word is one is not able to speak good words of praise to God without living in his word, running to the voice of the sayer, and letting that word control the fabric of your being. How many people have heard, people have quoted this, you know, text out of context, that no man can say Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, if a man utters that, then he must be saved. How many have heard that? But you know that that's really not true, even though the scripture declares it, it's out of context. Because even Satan recognized, now G Jesus, when he was tempted of the devil, of Satan, Satan didn't say, your Lord, but he did still come to tempt him with his word and quoted scripture. The word was being quoted scripture to. Jesus is being tempted by his very words, just twisted a little bit. So it's necessary to say that praise, praise to God, speaking good words to God, comes by way of obedience, which is the result, by the way, of us talking in two or three weeks ago of the lesson of the sanctification that happens, the separating act through the Spirit. And the Spirit is given to us. For I've painted the rainbow for you. There are many, many, many reasons why the Spirit is given to us as a comforter, one alongside, instruction, guidance, etc. But here it ties together with praise. You can no longer, and I can no longer, we are not able to praise God continuously and on an ongoing basis in the middle of our troubles and trials without God being at the center core of our being. Now, why do I say this? These very words are repeated, and they have a same opening and a different attachment. Focus in this passage here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, his abundant, according to his abundant mercy. It doesn't say according to his abundant grace, although grace is being spoken of just in the next verse above, but according to his abundant mercy, his abundant elios in the Greek, his abundant mercy. You ever stop to wonder? Sojourners, pilgrims, people passing through, people dispersed, praising God according to his abundant mercy, regarding a lively hope, regarding the resurrection. You and I could not do that if it wasn't by the gift of God's Spirit in us to be able to praise him in the midst of persecution and trouble, which is what this letter is going to address persecuted Christians living in such a terrible state 
that you and I, if we weren't children of the faith, would toss in the towel. There would be no promise to claim. There would be no act of faith. It would just be, well, all right. I succumb to whatever it is. Listen to these words, and then listen to the words delivered by Paul in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, first chapter and verse 3. Paul says virtually the same thing. You can fold your page and look at them side by side. That's even more helpful. I'll roll my Bible. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Different Greek word. And the God of all comfort. The principle still the same. You know, too many people spend their time focusing. There's different types of praise that we speak to God. We ask God for things. We, we petition Him. Most of the things that people ask for, for the most part, are frivolous and not necessary. But the nuts and bolts that we ask Him for, that we call on His name for, the necessities, the provision that we need, daily bread, healing, wisdom, guidance, Scripture says God is faithful that when we ask for these things, if we ask for bread, he'll not give us a stone. And both Paul and Peter are using the same words, eulogitos, eulogitos ho theos kai pater tu curio, blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Let's read on a little bit. It'll give you the same flavor for what's going to be said later on in 1 Peter, who comfort us in all our tribulation, who literally encourages us in all of our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Think on these things and go back to 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. His abundant mercy, knowing that his creation is fallen, knowing his creation is fallen and in sin and in a dark state without hope according to his abundant mercy. But let me tell you why I think we're going to camp out on this for a little while. Because I went through looking at all the places where people cried out for mercy in the scriptures, in the gospels. Did you ever read those passages? There's two blind men. Here's Jesus coming. And they cry out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Do you ever read the passage where it talks about the woman and her daughter, or the man and his son? Here comes Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on us. And the staggering thing in all of those examples where these people cry out and say, have mercy on us, son of David, they're all crying out. Forgive me, a little grammar interjected here. They're all crying out in the imperative for God to act so convinced, so persuaded by what they've heard that he is able. That got my attention, because we often talk about this. God's mercy and God's grace are two different things. God's mercy, as he's going by, you see Jesus seeing and meeting the need of those crying out, have mercy on us. And I believe Peter lifted up that word, not commonly used in this structure, as if to say the whole creation like Paul said, is crying out for this time to be touched and to be raised up, to be empowered, 
to a lively hope in the now and the future in the eternities. Now, that's pretty staggering that he would lift this one word out. And mercy is a subject that I hadn't really given too much thought about. Why is this important for us to understand? What dimension of this will bring us back to praising God, blessed be, and so forth, praising his name? It is the obedience and the act of faith in knowing that God is able in whatsoever state, whatever circumstance, whatever I see in front of me, God is able to solve the problem. There is, as I've said for weeks, no temptation, known demands, which is common demand that God has not in some place in his book given a promise, enabling. You want to try me? Yeah, I'll give you one. The same words are spoken by Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm only going to give you th these three examples to tell you how God has given us such a remarkable gift in his word. And if we will be anointed listeners to receive his word, there is comfort, there is peace. God has given a gift to us far beyond our comprehension in the flesh. Carnal mind cannot apprehend it. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, same word, eulogitos, hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, with all eulogia pneumatica, all good words in the spirit, through the spirituals, in the heavenlies, in Christ. You see, God's word and his speakers and writers are saying the same thing. No matter where you are, and these, by the way, in 2 Corinthians and in Ephesians are called saints, and in Peter it's the elect and chosen, scattered of God, no matter where you are in God's program, with the listening device turned on, you're able to give praise to him for the knowledge of what he's done. In 2 Corinthians, the passage is to comfort to give praise that he has brought us comfort. In Ephesians, we are giving him praise because he has given us good words. He has blessed us with good words through his word. Too many people talk about blessings of material things, but the blessings of his word that let me latch on and give me the hope and the promises that I need to survive in the faith daily. And then, of course, out of 1 Peter, we are praising God for his abundant mercy. And Peter, I want you to picture this, immediately picks up the resurrection. Three verses in. Talk about praising and lifting up and eulogizing God. He immediately, there is no other writer in the gospel records I'm talking about outside of the gospels, outside of the day of Pentecost in Acts. There is no one who takes right into telling us about out of his abundant mercy, how he's given us hope, begotten again, born from up above by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Pure gospel of encouragement to people who periodically their eyes get clouded with their problems. Anybody have that cloudy eye vision today? God's word should bring us closer to him, with a closer and better understanding. He has not called you into the kingdom today to leave you wandering around. To Listen, if you figure it out for yourself, you'll do what I've done for many years. you mess it up. But if you lean on God's word, he sorts it out. Sojourners, pilgrims, eulogizing God. Would you like for me to just tell you how God's word confirms itself over and over again, I thought to pick up on some Old Testament themes, some familiar ones, but I found a good promise out of Psalm 119. And I said, I'd, I'd line this up with all the scriptures I've given you today. 
praising God. 2 Corinthians, for his comfort. Praising God for his word, Ephesians. Praising God for his abundant mercy, 1 Peter, because of the resurrection of Christ, the first goer, now gives me the hope of that life eternal that I too will be raised up in the now and over there to be with him. Psalm 119 and verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. I'm going to ask you today to make that a promise if you're not in need of comfort or if you're not in affliction. Don't worry, as a saint of God, you will be eventually. <laughs> Isn't that a word of encouragement right there? Don't worry, you will be eventually. You probably heard me say this to you. Some of you, I, I know some of you just absolutely rejoice when I said I'm just so tired of how everybody from books to TV tells you how to live the victorious Christian life and they do it with a big polished smile and everybody's happy. There's no crying. No one's ever defeated. You know, I listen to uh, talk radio very seldomly, but I was coming from the north and I was a couple of hours in the car and I happened to listen to a professor from Wheaton College. I, I try not to listen to anything that is religion or religious based because normally it drives me crazy and I'll end up in a worse state of sinning. <laughs> and the latter is worse than the first, no. But um, I was listening to a brilliant PhD from Wheaton College. Doesn't really matter where he's from, he's pretty smart. And his discussion was with regard to um, people's addictions and addictive behaviors and how to break the addictive cycle. And as I listened to this, it gave me comfort because I was listening to people calling in and asking him questions. And I thought, my God, how many people in America suffer from some form of addiction? His particular topic, by the way, was pornography, people who are addicted to pornography. But that opens up a whole floodgate of addictions from uh, abuse that is not legal, the pharmacia that is street pharmacia, to the legal good old Kentucky Fried Chicken food. And how the mind at the root of everything has certain chemicals, we know this to be true, that produce certain behaviors. And the brilliance of what he said in giving comfort to some of these callers, and I thought this really hit me heavy. A woman called into the program and said, for 23 years, my husband has been addicted to pornography. He doesn't see anything wrong. I pray for him every day. Nothing's happening. What should I do? Now, the average Christian talking head would say, oh, just listen, recite this scripture and pray, and it'll go away. Not so. In fact, most of the time, we do well to start off by saying, Satan tries to get in the way the pathway of most believers, anywhere where you may have the opportunity to have a breakthrough of faith, Satan will rear his head, his minions, or anything else that he can send to blockade, create confusion and distraction. And by the way, you know, people have some idea about how things can just be pushed over and covered up by Scripture here, like a pill. Recite this scripture and you'll be okay. No, it's exacerbated by no help offered by anybody because no one wants to talk about these problems. And I listened to this man give a good word of advice to the woman. He said, keep praying, keep reading your Bible, stay in the word. In fact, you'd be surprised this was a Catholic talk radio. Who knew? <laughs> but what was amazing is what he said to the caller. He said, and I'm not going to give you the exact quote, but it was like this. He said, may God comfort and strengthen you to be able to deal with this situation more. And that's always the left out ingredient. Not only did he give her other things to do and things to look into, but he said, may God comfort and strengthen 
you, because there's always somebody, cause and reaction, there's always somebody affected by somebody else's decisions, by somebody else's addictions, by somebody else's problems. And I thought, it was so strange, this woman, before she hung up, she said, well, I just love God, and I'm so grateful that God, and I, I mean, I, I thought, wow, you know, multiply this woman, please. How, how many of us are praising God and thanking God for a word of comfort given in the midst of the storm? It's so easy to tell somebody else, but when it hits us, oh, thank God for this storm. Thank God for your word of comfort. So I'm highlighting this as my promise today to claim with you out of Psalm 119 and 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. His word has the power to do that. That's why I really believe without drifting too far outside of this word, eulogitos, the good, you good word of God, we have the ability to praise him like these people out of 1 Peter, in the midst of our crisis, in the midst of our disaster, we have the ability as faithers and trusters in God to say, no matter what, I will praise him. Now, there's a whole study that I'm going to open up. I don't want to do it today. I really felt like today I should just give some words of encouragement and comfort. But there's a whole study tackling mercy. I asked one of the staff people, I like to put people on the spot, I said, what's the difference between mercy and grace? Because grace, we walk in a sphere of grace. The scripture says we're saved by faith through grace. That is a dimension of our salvation. We walk in it not knowing it. And the difference between the two is made abundantly clear by David. When David cries out in, in his opening plea to God, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. It is God's hearing of our condition in our fallen, miserable state, not the state of a sinner or someone who is sinning, but picture the blind man crying out, Son of David, have mercy. A call for God to act and put his word into action in our lives as we act in faith on his word. Mercy opens up a whole new floodgate for me as a believer. You ever, you ever had a moment in your life where you've cried out to God, have mercy on my soul, in a weeping moment where you've just said, Lord, have mercy on me? And I thought, you know, that either is going to be a real thing for some people and it's going to offer some comfort because it's when we get in that state. You can't coerce that. You can't fake that state of crying out, Lord, have mercy on me. But when you get there, and if you've never been there, as I said, take courage, one day you will be. When you cry out, it is God's seeing as in the scriptures, when he was moved with compassion to act and heal the people, when he was moved with compassion to respond to the call of these people crying out, Son of David, have mercy. A specific cry. Now, as I said, there's a whole study that I've done on this, mercy versus grace. That is God's reaction to his creation calling out to him in a moment of need, not superficial, God, give me that Bugatti uh, racing car. I really want it. But Lord, have mercy on me. Fill in the blanks for you today, whatever that cry of need is. And when the heart cries out to God, help me, have mercy, God answers. You know, he hears everything, the prayers and the petitions, but a call for mercy through the scriptures has never gone unanswered. Why David in his state, it says Psalm 51, after he went into Bathsheba and then this was his psalm, the beginning of his psalm, begins with have mercy. So I'm saying to you today why we eulogize God, why we speak good words and lift up his name, blessing his name, because of his 
abundant mercy in our lives. Now, I could go and tell you all the things that abundant mercy has done in my life, but Peter is speaking of one specific frame of reference, a lively hope given to us, begotten again from up above with the hope of the resurrected Christ in mind. You know, when you focus on that, it makes all our other problems dwarfed, just eclipsed. You know, you can focus your mind on your problems in the now and keep focusing. I'm not telling you not to reach for a promise and latch on and believe and faith in God, but this specific abundant mercy that God has begotten us again to a lively hope through the resurrected Christ tells me something, no matter what you are going through as sojourners and pilgrims in the faith, the ultimate looking to Him dwarfs all my problems, calms my spirit. Thy word, thy, this is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The Hebrew says, hath given me life, has lifted me up, because that's where we spend a good part of our time as sojourners. Anyone who tells you the life of faith is easy is a liar. Want me to say that again? <laughs> Anyone who tells you the life of faith is easy is a liar. But those who have lived the life of faith know the reaching forward, the activity that is brought forth in reaching forward beyond the circumstances, how great and precious the reward when what you thought you could not handle, you look back and you say, eh, that was no big deal. What was I worried about anyway? Sojourners, pilgrims, eulogizing God. Now, I would, as I said, go on to just say a few things about mercy and grace, which I think are very important. You know, we talk about grace, and the simple definition of grace is God's unmerited favor. I did nothing to deserve it. I walk by faith in Him. I'm covered in that sphere of grace. Mercy is something else. In fact, there are many words in the Greek for mercy. This particular word I'm looking at, ilios, there's another word which, if you read in your King James, if you ever wondered why they used bowels of mercy, Sounds a lot comforting, bowels of mercy. <laughs> but that Greek word is from our, where we get our cognate word for spleen. It is the innermost being where it says the bowels of mercy, when he was moved with compassion, his tender mercies. God was moved on the inside as he walked by and saw the people. Something moved inside of him to reach down and heal to talk to, to deliver, to set free. That's one side of mercy. There's another side of mercy. You'll remember these, the bowels, the innards of a person. The mercy of God, oiktirmos, is another Greek word for mercy. That is, when God has pity on someone. It's really uh, very prevalent in the Old Testament, not so much in the New but this concept of God having pity on his creation is, falls under the banner of the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, and for the just he may have pity. Of course, there are different dimensions, but this one in particular, if I were to highlight and go through all the times that this word appears in the New Testament, it's staggering that Peter lifts out this one word. He could have used any word. He lifts out this one word, which, by the way, from a Jewish background, would encompass multiple words. Chesed, that's God's unconditional, unfailing love, number one. Number two, Chacham, that is from where we get the womb of a woman, the innermost being, encompasses that word, Elios. There are abundant words, including Han, or Chen, which is favor, encompassed in this word. 
So when we look at his abundant mercy towards the creation, knowing its fallen state, knowing its sinful state and its sinning state and its darkened state without hope, according to his abundant mercy, which brings with it his unfailing love towards his creation, his bringing forth, birthing from above a new creation, and the favor that we find with him encompassed in the Greek word grace or charis. All brought back to a recognition of where you and I started out, lost and darkened. Now we eulogize, we speak good words unto God. And he's not just saying a specific greeting, but for the sojourners, for the pilgrims, for the ones dispersed, for the ones displaced, for the sick today, for the ones that need healing. And I know there's many here that need healing today. For the ones that are displaced, and I'm talking about no home, no place to go, no family, no friends. This is where we begin our voyage into 1 Peter. These who are we now, the church, on a journey of faith, able to eulogize and praise and give thanks to God for his abundant mercy in our need. He knew we needed to be delivered and saved as a people, so he sent his only begotten son. And if you just, just camp on that for a while and come back to the reality, God's word, his good word that he's given us, we turn around and in turn and say, we praise him for that which he has given. Listen, if God never gave me another thing in my life, if I never got another thing from God, somebody say, how could you say that? Because the thing he blessed me with, his word, is more than any riches I could ever possess and anything I could ever buy or try to aspire to be because he's given me his word according to that abundant mercy. Now, for those needing the comfort, for those who may be in affliction today, take comfort. There's many people on the same journey. You're not alone, not because you have brothers and sisters making the trip, but because God is our comforter with us. Will you just keep that in your hearts and get ready for a, a little bit more in-depth study next week, entering into the sojourners and pilgrims eulogizing God. All right? That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.